Good afternoon, everybody. As always, my name is JC, and welcome to my channel, Every Man's Thoughts. Spoiler warning, today I'm going to be breaking down episode three from season one of House of the Dragon, so you've been warned, and with that, let's get started. We open episode three where episode two left off. Corliss, the sea snake, has manipulated Damon into attacking the Stepstone pirates, even though his older brother, the king, wanted no part of this war. Of course, the dragon attacks look cool, and I'm rather starting to enjoy this crab feeder. He's got a unique look about him, and he's enigmatic. I'd, I'd be interested in learning a little bit more about his backstory. The main point of this scene, though, is to set up the rest of the episode and show how you can have a dragon, but you're still not invincible. We see this when Damon takes a flaming arrow to the shoulder and is forced to flee. Remember that his great-great-great aunt Rhaenys died in the early days of Aegon's conquest when her dragon took an arrow to the eye. We then transition into a feast being held for the king's son's second name day, in other words, his second birthday. The obvious implication here is that we've jumped ahead three years in time, two years for the child's age and nine months for the gestation. What's interesting here is, despite hearing troubling reports about his brother and the Sneeze Snake losing the war, the king seems solely focused on the location of his daughter. The king's continuing affection for his daughter, despite the fact that his brother is in trouble and he has a newborn son, provides us with some foreshadowing. This affection is so obvious that the king's best friend, who also serves as the hand of the king and is the grandfather to the new royal prince, that he even states that he doesn't think the king will elevate the newborn prince Aegon above his daughter Rhaenyra in the line of succession. For Rhaenyra's part, despite the personal growth she showed at the end of episode 2, she's still struggling with her father's new marriage and her roles and responsibilities within the court. Now, I know there's been a lot of criticism that this character is too annoying or just an angsty little emo. I would remind people this is a teenage girl who's known nothing but power and privilege her, her entire life, and her father is just too amiable to go upside her head and teach her a five-knuckle lesson. So this is exactly what you should expect. However, given the current zeitgeist in the entertainment industry, I'm always afraid they're going to turn the female heroine into some form of Mary Sue. So I'm actually quite happy they're taking their time with this character, showing her flaws and her growth. In later seasons, this is going to pay off with a much richer and more interesting character. Where there's weakness, though, there's also strength. She's still forthright and bold, but her greatest asset is how grounded she is with emotional stability. As we watch the confrontation with her father, you don't see the tears or stamping of the feet or anything else that would indicate a lack of emotional control. We finally see the princess deal with these pent-up emotions when she does to this boar what my ex-girlfriend did to my checking account. She also continues to rise above others and has just a little bit of arrogance that I've come to enjoy. Have you served the one with late lady red wine by eating cake? Got to love that dog. Lastly, I want to say I've also become quite fond of the scenes between the king and his daughter. Each interaction leaves you with a greater appreciation of both characters. How can you not be empathetic to the king? He's a decent man who just can't get through to his headstrong daughter, something I think every parent can understand. On the flip side, you also understand Rhaenyra's point of view, a capable young woman who's bucking against her course that has long since been predetermined. The acting skill of these two is giving each scene a, a genuine flavor that is actually driving the series thus far. Confuse me at every turn. That is because I do not wish to get married. Even I do not exist above tradition and duty, Rhaenyra. If I did have a complaint, I'd say that this plotline did consume too much of the episode. Once you have a job and bills to pay and you've left your parents' house, life gets real and there's only so much teenager you can take in a day. I would have preferred more time being dedicated to the war in the Stepstone Isles. We went from the start of the war to the end of the war within one episode and only a few minutes on screen. That just doesn't feel like Game of Thrones pacing to me. Okay, so let's move on. Beyond the relationship between the king and his daughter, we have the subplot of where the children should fall in the line of succession. Rhaenyra is older, but Aegon is a boy. Tradition dictates that the throne usually passes through the oldest born son. During the hunt dedicated to Aegon, a white stag is spotted. 
as the white stag is a symbol of royalty, though supporting Aegon very loudly interpret this as the gods blessing Aegon's ascension. However, when the beast is caught, it's not a white stag. In truth, the white stag shows itself to Rhaenyra. The symbolism is obvious. In another excellent scene between father and daughter, king and princess, the king lets Rhaenyra know that she will stay first in line for order of succession. Okay, let's wrap this up by talking about that war we've gotten to see so little of. The Stepstone Isles are a choke point in a vital shipping lane. The pirates have entrenched themselves there so they may do as they will with the passing merchant vessels. This is fairly book accurate. In fact, there had been multiple instances in the past where someone conquered these barren, useless rocks just so that they could charge the passing merchants a toll for safe passage. The merchants actually preferred this because a small toll is just a cost of doing business, whereas pirates, well, that's another matter entirely. Nothing's more expensive than blood. As Corlys Valerian's wealth and power are derived from the fleet of ships he controls, you can see why this was such an important issue for him to resolve. This is why he turned to Daemon once the king refused to help. Although the overall scenario is, again, relatively book accurate and the scene looks amazing, the writing here is a little silly. They say they can't attack the beach because the archers hold the high ground and will pick them apart. If they send the dragon, then everybody just retreats into the caves. However, let's play this out. The archers are on the high ground, which means they are separated from the ground forces, which also means then that they are subject to a dragon attack without the dragon having to worry about hitting his own people. If the archers return to the caves, the defenders have now lost their advantage and would likely be overwhelmed by the attackers. If the defending ground forces also retreat into the cave, they are now cut off from food and water and have no capability to molest the passing merchant ships. Furthermore, the scene shows the pirates hitting the passing ships with what looks like either a catapults or trebuchets. In order for either of those type siege weapons to work, they would have to be exposed to open air, which in turn would mean that they would be exposed to a dragon attack. Anyway, that's just my two cents. Let's get back to the episode. So the pirate rebels are entrenched, the whole thing is at a stalemate, and time is on the side of the pirates. Damon receives a letter from the king that states the king is sending reinforcements to aid in the war effort, and this infuriates Damon. Now Damon's in a tough spot. If he attacks before the reinforcements gets there, his forces are depleted, and the defenders have the advantage, he will likely lose and be humiliated. If he waits for the reinforcements, even if he wins, the victory will belong to the king as it would play as if he was losing and then was bailed out by the crown. Essentially just another form of humiliation. This is why Damon beats the messenger. He knows he's in a no-win situation. Unless, of course, he wins the war before the king's reinforcements arrive. So, at this point, in Damon's mind, he has no choice but to sacrifice himself as bait to draw out the pirates from their defensive positions. The plan works, the defenders are caught off guard, and eventually Damon tracks down and slaughters the crab feeder himself. As I mentioned earlier, I really regret this storyline only lasting a small part of one episode. I would have liked to have seen more backstory on the crab feeder. He looked like an interesting character. Maybe show some of the earlier battles where the attacking forces were victorious, as per the books and maybe dedicating more time to a more plausible scenario as to why the attackers could not achieve final victory. As I look back at this episode in the series as a whole, I have to say I'm more impressed each week more than the last. The writing has been better week over week. Early episodes, of course, are always tough because you have so much exposition. The CGI has improved and the set design continues to be incredible. I'm also pleased and frankly surprised at how reasonably faithful they're being to the original source material. Adaptations like this can never be completely book accurate, but they're nailing all the important high points and doing a far better job than, say, Wheel of Time or Rings of Power. I suspect this has to do with George R.R. R. Martin's direct involvement with the series. He recently stated that he was shut out of the last few seasons of Game of Thrones, and we know how that went. I'd wager he learned a lesson there and is likely not willing to let that happen again. My one complaint would be they haven't given us an accurate portrayal of the relationship between Rhaenyra and her uncle Daemon. Obviously, the whole who falls where in the line of succession is by its very nature adversarial, 
but there was great affection between those two. That affection complicated the dynamic between the two and, in my humble opinion, enriched the story as a whole. Well, everybody, that's it for me this week. Please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and I will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.